There are several places in the Bible that speak to us of the gifts of the Spirit. And I think we should look at those places uh, tonight at the very beginning. So turn with me now to the 12th chapter of Romans, which is one of the paramount places that mentions the uh, gifts of the Spirit. Beginning with verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. We're linked together. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. All of the other portions we have already read. These graces, favors, gifts, kindnesses, charisma, that the Lord has given, are given for the benefit of the church. They are not confined to the clergy. They are, instead of being confined to the clergy, far, far more often than not, manifested through individuals of the congregation. Now, that is going to distinguish them, these particular gifts, from these gifts, which are the ministry, even though we often find them mingled together in one discourse as they are here. And as we will find them especially in the scripture I'm going to read you just a little bit later. Now these gifts are not exercised by the whole body. You go to a general assembly and you will hear someone in the topmost balcony begin to speak with tongues. And you will hear someone across that great chasm of the auditorium give the interpretation. Neither of whom may be ministers. You go into a church, a local church, and you will see the same thing happening. Yet, those people do not get up and take the place of these gifted persons who are permanent, called, divinely appointed ministers. The body of spiritual gifts or blessings or graces or powers are given for the whole body to bless the whole body. Therefore, a great deal of time is devoted in Scripture to showing how these gifts do operate. And we know from the first epistle to the Corinthians, in three entire chapters, that there was such a desperate need of understanding that Paul devoted three chapters, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, to explaining carefully and in detail to them how the gifts of the Spirit operate and should operate. Now they are here. They're here. They're set in the body. They're for our manifestation. They're for our blessing. They're for our benefit. And God may touch one person or another as He will for the operation of them. Now, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul, first of all, begins the subject by saying, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, 
I would not have you ignorant. There was a real need even then that they understand, that they truly comprehend the nature of the spiritual gifts. He talks about these gifts in considerable detail. Beginning with verse 4, he said, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Now it is vital that you understand what Paul is saying here because there is one word that keeps the entire thing straight. And that is this. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For the one is given by the Spirit. Go back to manifestation. The manifestation of the word of wisdom to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another divers kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit, Dividing to every man, these are important words, dividing to every man severally as he will. Now the whole inference here is a continuing operation that reposes the entire gift process into the wisdom and to the knowledge of and into the grace and to the will of God. Now he has given the church these and the church is to operate them. The church is to be filled with them. I think every congregation, I think that every assembly, I think that every body of Christian people should have routinely and regularly all of the spiritual manifestations working among it. Now, to believe then that God will confine himself or limit himself even to a measure to the discretion or accessibility of one individual is to belittle the sovereignty of God. If I have as my own gift that God has given me, then I have something that not Paul, not Peter, not James, not John, not Philip, ever, ever laid claim to you will find these apostles, you will find these ministers designated and identified with one of these gifts. One would be a prophet. One would be an apostle. One would be an evangelist. But where do you find any one man ever, ever identified as having the gift of healing. Healing just occurred in the body of Christ. Where do you find a statement anywhere in Scripture that designates a single person of all Scripture as having possessed that which had been given to him and was exclusively his? It is not there then it looks to me like surely the Bible would have just slipped up somewhere along the line and have stated it if that was the way it operated in Bible times. No. If a word of wisdom needed, God used Paul or God used another and it was given. 
If a healing was needed, then God used whoever was available and He gave it. And nowhere, nowhere, Paul strongly, strongly asserted that he was an apostle. But he never even hit it. Except one time when he said, I speak with tongues more than you all. Other than that, there is not even a hint there that he laid claim that I have a gift. Nor do I know any responsible person of even late days that has maintained such pretenses as, as that. The truth of the matter is, God wants me to be close enough to Him that no matter what He needs done, I am available for that manifestation and it will be done. So let us go on and let us continue to read. For the, as the body is one and hath many members and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. But the body is not one member, but many. And then he goes on to give the analogy with the human body. And he comes down to verse 25. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church. Here he's going to mingle the two because they are indeed united together and they work in complementing one another. And he combines them at this point. He has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gift. Now the question was asked this morning about the best gift. This word best is definitely a relative word rather than a comparative word. Who am I? How can I covet the best gift when I don't even know what the best gift is? I don't know what is the best gift. The best gift is the gift that is needed at any particular time. Maybe in my opinion, the word of wisdom is the best gift. Therefore I covet it, that it be manifested, that it be there. But there's no need for it now. Instead of that, there is a need of the gift of faith. Well, when the gift of faith is needed, that is the best one. So this relates to the need. It relates to the circumstance, and those are things that God and God alone will know. Now, before we finish, we will begin tonight and finish it tomorrow morning. We're going to look at these individually and see how each one operates in the church. And I will give you some examples that I have witnessed, and we will try to see them very, very clearly. But it's very important that at this point now, we begin to understand that God does not and cannot yield his sovereignty to anybody. The gifts of revelation. These are gifts in which he literally reveals a part of his mind, his divine omniscience to mortal man. 
If Jesus said, I can do nothing while he was on the earth, then where in the world can I, maintaining meekness and understanding and, and all that I have to be, still lay claim and say, I have a gift of wisdom. I am saying then that God has permanently, to me, yielded a part of his own omniscience. Now where does meekness fit with such an arrogating claim as that? It isn't a gift of wisdom. It is a manifestation of the word of wisdom. And we'll get to that when we come to it. I'm trying to show you that there is no problem. There is no problem at all. I just, the situation just beggars our understanding. That's all. There is no problem. It's a matter of sometimes a zeal of the house of the Lord eating him up. When we begin to make claims that cannot be substantiated spiritually or practically. When I was president of Lee College, I had to do a lot of traveling for the college. The board of directors passed a measure that provided the president with a presidential vehicle. They handed me the key. My car. I parked it in my place. I ran into town with it. I came to California in it. But there were times that someone needed to use that vehicle. And I wasn't around. They got the key. And they used the vehicle. Now the vehicle, almost every time you saw it, I was in it driving. But yet I knew it wasn't mine. And on that glad day, when I announced that I was resigning from Lee College, I didn't mean glad day. Yeah, I did. When I announced that I was leaving Lee College, do you know what I had to do? I had to walk in to Lee College and hand over my keys my telephone credit card, my American Express credit card. Man, I'd use that for identification more time than you can imagine. Bought more stuff than you can imagine. Refund the college. I had to hand over the, to them my air travel card. Now they didn't mind. <coughs> You call American Express in Phoenix, Arizona, and they tell you I've been a member since 1960. You call them now. Oh, Mr. Collins not a member. Well, I never was. Lee College was. And I was the president of Lee College. Therefore, I had access to and used them, and they served every practical purpose in that way. But old Brother Khan maintained enough good sense to know all through those years, hey, they ain't mine. Do you understand? If I had ever imagined they were mine, I'd be in a pen somewhere now. I would be somewhere that I'm not if I had not been able to keep it straight up here in my own head. Hey, these are accoutrements of the office that I fail. Now the same thing is true of everything I receive of the Lord. He is willing to bless me with it. He is willing for me to use it. He is willing to manifest it through me. 
He does manifest it through me. But never should I become arrogant enough to say it is mine. Are you hearing me? I am his. I am just his. That's all. So if he says to me, there's a message out there that needs to be interpreted. And here it comes through me. And the interpretation is there. There is a sick man out there that needs healing. And here it comes through me. And there is healing. If I'm not present, Somebody else. Even if I am present, it may be somebody else. But what disorder extends from the rivalries that begin to arise in local situations when one can say, oh, I have this and I have that. I was at a church one time where a man... Uh, said, I've got the gift of discernment, of interpretation, interpretation. I've got the gift of interpretation. And so that during the morning service, he hadn't been there, and there had been a message given in tongues, and that night, oh, Brother Joe, I wish you could have been here this morning. A message was given in tongues, and we needed you to interpret it. Now, God was hogtied. He couldn't work it because Brother Joe wasn't there. <laughs> so Brother Joel said, well, listen, I don't have to be here. You just tell me what was said, and I'll tell you now what it means. <laughs> then, after a while, we do begin to say, as the eye said, what need do I have of the foot? Then we do begin to say, I have a superior gift, therefore I have more. Mm -hmm. We all have all the gifts. And we need to be yielded to Him and let them flow freely to us. Now I told you on our opening session about God's process of transposition. It is indeed a fact that one man or one woman may be used so constantly with one gift that fits naturally into their lives and into what they are, their persons, that God just frequently does it. I'll be honest with you. Many times when a message is given in tones, I rather expect that God will use that particular person for it, and often he does. <laughs> but never, ever, ever has it dawned on me that the gift is his. It's that God chooses frequently, regularly, routinely to use him for the manifestation of that gift. <clears throat> Am I making sense to you at all? Are you seeing what I'm trying to say? God cannot and will not restrict himself. If Jesus Christ could do nothing except what he saw God do, how can we do anything less? Hmm. Now let me go on. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Still, he's talking about spiritual gifts. Now remember, there's no end of chapter there. In the Paul's writing, it flows right on. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. That's what he's just been talking about. And I don't have love. I've begun to be arrogant. Or self-willed or self-centered. I've begun to arrogate to myself things that are not mine. I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, that's the word of wisdom, and all knowledge, 
That's the word of knowledge. And though I have all faith, that's the gift of faith. So that I could remove mountains and have not love, charity. I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Then he goes on to show what love will do, that love will keep correct all of the manifestation of the gifts. Paul continues through quite a little way and goes on to say this. Follow after love and desire spiritual gifts. He's not talking to one or two persons in the congregation. He's talking to the whole body now. But rather that ye may prophesy. And then he continues for a long, long time in giving an explanation of the exercise of tongues. Now, that much, three whole chapters of explanation and regulation were required in that day for this. And that being so, you can imagine how very, very much it is important to us. I hate to read to you a whole lot of what I have written, but you have it in the book and can read it yourself, but I'm going to do it anyway, okay? Because well, this is very important where we are now. A question of great importance regarding this is on page 104, regarding the gifts of the Spirit, is the manner in which they are gifts. In our culture, this is America, or Western culture, a gift belongs to the receiver or else it is no gift at all. Now that's the way we see it. We give things without condition. We give the gifts in perpetuity. And we imagine, because we are so immersed in Western culture, that that is the only way to do it. Well, one of the biggest problems I see in our world missions program is that we try sometimes to make people in other lands and other cultures Americans as much as we try to make them Christians. And we try to assume that our way of doing it in good old USA is the only way to do it. From the way they, well, nothing, stupid. <laughs> there must be no strings attached or we regard that it is not truly a gift. That's us. This is not the scriptural view of gifts, but that of Western man. Then I go and give an example that I gave this morning. This is certainly not God's way of giving. For all his gifts are with condition. His gifts are for a sacred purpose. And if that purpose is profaned, then the gift is withdrawn. In all cases, the Lord retains the power of his gifts. Thank God. Thank God. I'm glad. I am glad. Thank God. Thank God he doesn't even answer all my prayers the way I want him to answer them. Thank God he says no. Man, we're, we'd be in a different world if he'd answered all my prayers like I wanted them answered. Yeah. People living today would be dead. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Do you think you're going to turn all that over to me? I know me. You understand? I'm a fallible, <laughs> tempestuous human being. 
And I see people and decide there's nothing good in them. And I wipe them out. But God doesn't answer that. He said, give me a chance. And he works with them. And some of the best friends I got now would be pushing up daisies. It had been left up to me somewhere along the line. God's not going to do it like that. Not at all. He retains the power and the wisdom and the understanding and the glory. And I, by submission to Him, will be used as He will for His glory. Mm. Let me tell you a little story. Have you ever been in love? Mm. Worst feeling in the world. Man, it is terrible. You lose weight or gain it. One of the two. You won't stay the same. You sleep too much or don't sleep enough. It's terrible. Well, I had that malady to come upon me one time when I met this lean, raven crest, svelte, young vision of loveliness. Mm, how I did pray. Never, 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 ever did I pray, oh God, make her love me. That would be unfair. I said, oh God, you know what she loves. Make me that. <laughs> Make me that. Help me to be whatever it is that girl will love. And you know what? We teamed up on her. And I asked her one first time I mentioned Mariner, she laughed in my face. She should have done that. <laughs> So Christmas time came and we left Lee College where we were students. And I got all the money I could break up and scrape up to buy that vision a Christmas gift. And I bought her two big boxes of stuff. So much I didn't even have enough money to get from my house in Atlanta to her house in Decatur, Alabama. So there wasn't but one thing left for me to do. And that was to do what any decent college boy would do. I hitchhiked. I was good at it back in those days. You wouldn't think it now, but man, I could do it. And I started out, and when I got off down on those long country roads across North Alabama, I didn't have a one dress up suit and that was blue serge. That was my preacher suit. Well, I was going to be a preacher. And here I was with these big packages and a suitcase in my blue serge suit on a dusty country road. But worse than that, I had an ingrown toenail and limped everywhere I went. And I stood there for an hour. Hardly anybody came by. Finally, I realized, hey, I'm never going to make it. I'll never make it. I'll never make it at all. I've got a hundred miles to go. No way I can make it. So I did have enough money to buy me a bus ticket from Fort Payne down the road and get me on there. And so I got down on the side of the road and I prayed. I said, now God, I want you to make the next fellow who comes by stop and give me a ride to Fort Payne. Because this woman that I'm going to marry, that you gave me, is waiting down there to see me. And I know it's your will for me to go. So you please make the next fellow stop and take me to Fort Payne so I can catch a bus and go on there. Believe it or not, while I was praying, I heard the motor as a car came. Praise God forever. Here he came. And when he came, I stuck out my thumb, ready to start going the best you can with an ingrown toenail to get in the car. And he went wide, whoosh, like that. 
He didn't even slow down. All he did was blow dust on my blue serge suit. And it hurt my feelings with God. And I tried it again. Pouting with God a little bit. And I said, oh God, I just want to go 10 miles down there to Fort Payne. Make him stop and give me a ride. Same result. And I didn't feel much like praying anymore. I saw that prayers were not getting me very far. But the Lord knew my heart. And the next thing that came along was a great big old trailer tractor rig with a big sign on the window, no riders. And then I really did complain to God then. What did you send him along for? He can't even give me a ride. And not until he was even with me did I even gesture that I would like a ride. But you know what? He stopped. And I grabbed up my gifts and my suitcase and I ran on my ingrown donate and started crawling in the cab of the truck. And he said, how far are you going? Well, I've been living all day long on two and three and four mile trips. I said, as far as you're going. He said, well, I'm going to, uh, to Little Rock, Arkansas. I said, I'm not going that far. I'm just going to Decatur, Alabama. He looked at his watch and said, I'll be there in an hour and a half. Hmm. Do you know what he did? He rolled around and twisted through the little old streets of Decatur, Alabama, up to my sweetheart's door and let me out. Man, that was a chauffeur service of the first degree. Now, why in the world am I telling you that story? God told me no to that first prayer. You understand? He had to tell me no then in order to tell me yes here. God does that and we have to leave it to his sovereignty. Can you understand that? God will tell you no anytime. And he has a right to tell you no. And no is an answer as much as yes is an answer. He answers your prayers with no's. But every time he does, it's because he has a greater yes coming down the road. Hallelujah. So you just remember that. Every time he says no to this, it's because a bigger yes is on the way. You just wait for it. Now that's here too. And we get out of our place sometimes when we begin to, in the name of the gifts, to order God around. We want him to heal who we want heal, when we want them heal, how we want them heal. <coughs> Do you understand? We want it done our way, and we are on the verge of robbing God of his sovereignty. When he gave us grace, he didn't give us sovereignty. And we are mixing it up. And so, one error after another comes along. And right now, we're living in the middle of another one. If you want it, just name it. God will give it to you. Mm, I didn't want to get on that. But that's where we are. The whole name it, claim it business is taking God out of his place and putting ourselves in his place and putting him in our place. You know, that whole theory, since I'm on it, issues from one scripture. And that scripture is found in the writings of John 
where he writes to Gaius in 3 John and says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. We've taken that word prosper there, which means succeed, and made it getting rich. And now then it's scattering all over the country. If you're not rich, you're not in God's will. If you're not prospering financially, you're just out of God's will. Hey, don't tell me that. I'm living in the richest country the world has ever seen. No nation that has ever existed from the beginning of time until right now is, rich, is as rich as America is right now. So don't tell me. I don't need it. Go to Bangladesh and tell them. Go to Bombay, India and tell them. Go where I see people lying on the sidewalks and never have a thing to live in except for a little marked out place of the sidewalk. They need it. And if it will work here, it will work there. Amen. Take it to Haiti. No, no, no. I get weary of these people here in the richest country the world has ever known trying to justify some of their own avariciousness by putting a guilt trip on everybody who still prays for their daily bread. That's not what Paul, John meant. John meant that I want you to get along well. God promised me one thing. He promised that he will supply all my need according to his riches and glory. Right? Amen. And what we are in danger of doing is confusing his blessings with his promises. God blesses us with certain things and we sometimes become spoiled by his blessings and begin to demand them. God doesn't care how much you're rich. If you'll handle it right and do well by it. But there's no promise in God's word he's going to make you rich. If his promise is to you in America that he'll make you a millionaire, then that promise is just as valid for the man in Bangladesh and in Ethiopia as it is for you. His promise that he will save a man who confesses and repents of his sin is just as valid for a man in those starving countries as they are here. The poorest man in any country upon the face of the earth can repent of his sins and call upon God and God will hear him and save him. Amen. So if it's a promise of God, it's as much a promise over there as it is here. But if that is what Paul, what John meant, then he's a funny guy. He preached what he didn't practice. He didn't practice what he preached. Because here he is telling us that God wants us to be rich. And the last time I heard from John, he was at the beautiful gate of Simon Peter. And he said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have give I thee. Can he be that way and then tell you that you will be a millionaire? These are errors that creep in and constantly, one after another, parade through the Pentecostal movement. And you need to be on guard against them. You accept the sovereignty of God. You accept that. Hmm. Excuse me, I didn't. Yeah, I did. I, and I knew this morning that we needed to devote a little more time to something that has become a critical area and a critical issue with uh, the Church of God right now. So before we break at 8 o'clock, what questions do you have? This, this is a time for us to to bring it on out, bring it on up to the surface and let us look at it, okay? Yes? Um, in dealing with this and realizing that there are things that need to be dealt with, problems, why do you feel that it's many times in history, not just in this day and time, why do you feel that it's taken so long for the, the church to deal with it when the Bible expresses in many places how it should be dealt with, when people do have problems? You know, that, that's what always boggles my mind. <laughs> He's asking uh, why the church is slow in dealing with some of the errors that creep in. I think uh, the church of necessity has to be judicious 
And then, in other words, we don't want to be in the place of denying a truth or denying a blessing or denying something like that. But neither uh, do we... Uh, well, we've had to deal with a lot of things in the church of God. In the earliest days, it was handling snakes. In a uh, day later than that, it uh, was still another part. It was the exclusiveness of the church being born into the church of God or added to the, the divine church, either one. The whole church issue became a big problem. And uh, in my lifetime, I have seen one after another, after another, after another pop up. And uh, one of the big things we've had to deal with in recent days has been the whole charismatic movement. When I was first saved, all we did was to pray, oh God, send down the blessing and baptize the Baptists, the Methodists, and the others. And when I joined the church, the pastor would say, I'm not seeking your membership. I want you to take the, I want you to take the message of the blessing back to your church. And we waited for it and longed for it and wanted it, just like the Pharisees wanted the Messiah. But then when it began to happen, it scared the socks off of a bunch of us. And I don't understand it saved my life. And instead of rejoicing mm -hmm. that it had happened, we became leery of it. You know, watch it. I don't really know why that happens. Uh, the, the church too often, in apostolic days and others, has been boxed into a defensive posture instead of an expensive <coughs> posture. But that does happen. And uh, one thing is, well, let me give you one story. Terrible, but it's a good one. A woman came into my office while I was the editor in chief, and a minister was with her, and this was in the days of this latter rain. She didn't open her mouth to say a word, but the preacher talked fast, and they wanted me to put her testimony in the evangel. And so, what had happened was she had had a cavity in her teeth and had prayed for the Lord to heal her teeth. And he did. He healed it with gold. Praise God. Then he turned the whole blessed tooth into gold. She began to get a lot of attention. And then the man said, show him, sister so-and-so. And she smiled. And it almost blinded me. Her whole mouth was full of gold. Full of gold. God had turned her teeth into gold. And here she sat in my office wanting me to put her testimony in the evangel. And I said, that's remarkable. But before I publish it in the evangel, we'll go down to a dentist and have him to check it out. And he'll verify to me that it is indeed gold and that it is indeed teeth. <laughs> no, sir. No, sir. No, sir. She told me. I'm not talking about something I heard. I'm talking about happened to be with pressure on me now from all around me wanting me to run this precious woman's testimony. And all this time I'm getting called unbeliever, unbeliever, unbeliever. Liberal, liberal. I always bring that one out. <laughs> she told me that God had told her if she ever let a dentist look at him, he would take the gift away from her. Well, I understand that. Come on. Came to understand it a whole lot better. The Lord's got to give me aid forever. I was sure trying. President Black, I tried. God knows I tried. I even asked that woman to come and go with me down to my house. And let me share this glorious story with my wife. And I got down on my knees and asked her to pray for me. You've got to give me aid forever. Now, General Sear doesn't believe that. He said, <laughs> you didn't. Do it, said you doubted it from the beginning and said if it, if it hadn't, you would have been shocked more than anybody else. Do you know what really began happening later? Diamonds. Rubies began to appear between our teeth. Well, that bothered me. I wouldn't want God to give me that much. <laughs> I, I, like, I like to run the 
dental floss between my teeth and I wouldn't want a diamond in the way, not even a diamond. You understand? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, it came out that she, before her presentation of herself, would pimp foil around her teeth. Spurious all the way. And I could stand here until the evening is over and tell you one after another spurious miracles I have had paraded before me. And I, in preaching about it, and teaching about it, exactly like I'm doing here, have had committees formed and gone to headquarters to protest my disturbing of faith. <laughs> I have twice been rebuked, once out here on the West Coast, where I was a Bible teacher at a camp meeting, for the same thing. That's one reason. You've always got a lot of people out there that are grabbing and ready to swallow anything that is said and make it rough on anybody that will stand up against Amen. the things that are fake false. That's a whole different, that's a whole different course. I teach, I, I teach a whole course in that from the anatomy of evil. I don't want to get on that now. But let me tell you that is a problem and it's going to be a bigger problem and you're going to see it. And for goodness sake, God does not expect you to throw your mind out of gear just because he gives you the blessings of heaven. Accept them and use them and, and be used of God. But for goodness sake, do what he said. Try the spirits and be sure what is happening is true. Mm. Can you forgive me for taking up a whole hour just on answering some of these problem areas because we've still got a long way to go. So we're going to break right now for uh, 12 minutes and then we'll be right back and get started again. Amen. Before he died, Jesus said in John 14 and 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Strangely, that simple scripture there has given rise to a great deal of controversy and misunderstanding. And I have seen people claiming spurious powers, deceitful works, and when I have contacted them and asked them upon what authority do you claim this or do this? If it is God's, it will be found in the Word of God so they can find that scripture. And they said, God said, we will do greater works. Therefore, a woman can come to my office and pretend that her teeth have been turned into gold. A boy can come in and pretend that he can see without an eyeball. People can come parading through my office because I was editor of a religious journal and show me the most spurious claims of things that were happening. <laughs> and sometimes when I would question them upon it, they turn to that scripture. There is no scripture that validates it, they would have to acknowledge. But it did say that greater works than these shall he do. And these are, they would tell me, the greater works. And the most phenomenal things have been claimed to me through the years on the basis of that scripture. Now then, that is the word of God. That is indeed what Jesus said. So in order for us to understand it, let's simply look at it. That is what he said. He said to his disciples when he is talking about leaving and going back to heaven, the 14th chapter of John is given to that one valedictory that the Lord is making to his disciples. 
Now he is going to be taken away from them. And when he is, he wants to assure them that his work will go on. He's told them all the great promises of how the Holy Ghost is going to come. This comforter will be with them and so on. All of these that are wonderful things. But then he says in the 12th verse, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Well, that needs to be understood. We need to comprehend it. So let's comprehend it right now, simply by looking at the Scripture. To begin with, what he said was works, which are not necessarily miracles, because his work was to preach the gospel to the poor, and his works were to do the things he listed in the temple in Jerusalem. Those are his works. The next word we need to look at is the word greater. Greater works than these shall he do because I go to my father. Now greater, what does the word greater mean? The word greater and more clearly in the original language than even in ours, though ours is perfectly clear enough. Greater means one of two things. One thing can be greater than another in kind or quality. Or one thing can be greater than another in size, scope, or quantity. Now he meant one of those two. He either meant when he said greater works that those who would follow him would do a greater kind of work or they would do a greater amount of work. Now which one did he mean? Now we find the clue in what he had to say in the same verse. All you have to do is to read it. Greater works than these shall he do. Why? Because I go unto my Father. My life is being cut short after only three and a half years. I have not traveled more than 140 miles from my home. Not even that far from my home. The whole land was only 140 miles. But if he meant one of the two, the key to which one he meant is in the fact that he said, because I go unto my Father. He is definitely referring to the time limitations upon his own ministry. You're going to do more than I have done because you're going to have longer to do it. I have only had three and a half years I go unto my Father. Now that certainly seems on the face of it exactly what he meant. But when we look further into the very same verse, we can begin to see. Now then, if there are two ways of being greater, a Cadillac is a greater car than a T-Model 4. You see, you can be greater in kind. But Texas is a greater state than Georgia in scope. And Alaska is greater in size than Texas. You can be greater that way. Now then, did he mean that, which seems to be what he meant, because he said, because I go to my father, or did he really mean that you will do a greater kind of work than he did? And let's look at his works. In the spiritual realm, he did works. And in the physical realm, he did works. Now, in the physical realm, among other things, he raised the dead to life again. Is there a greater physical work than that? 
Can you do a greater kind of physical work than that? No. In the spiritual realm, he forgave sins. And you can't even do that. It's not even possible, not even possible for anybody any time in any generation or any century to do a greater kind of work than Jesus did. Then what he had to mean was a greater reach, scope, mass of work. Paul, who would come right behind him, would travel to the farthest reaches of civilization. He would get as far away as Spain and he would preach to kings and rulers. Now then, we come down to 1984. In 1984, as limited a preacher as I am, I have on CBN, on various other of these programs, spoken to more people in one sitting than Jesus saw in his whole lifetime. <laughs> this is a greater quantity of work. A greater exposure of work. Here I am still a young man in my vigor and vitality. And already I have preached 45 years. 46 years that I preached. And in those 46 years I have preached to far more people than Jesus. I have led far more people to salvation than he did. I lead them only to him though. I don't think I'm confusing anything. I'm just trying to show you that that I have had a greater time and an opportunity to do infinitely greater things than he did. And all of you are going to have the same thing, therefore you're going to do more. You're going to do more than he did because he had to go to his father <coughs> to give us the basis for doing it at all. But now, there are still some, and I still encounter it, where people still say they can do a greater, more spectacular, sensational work than Jesus ever did. Well, that's some claim. Mm -hmm. That is some claim. So let's look at it. Let's look at what it says in the verse. He that believeth on me, first of all, the works that I do, shall he do also. Right? Did he say that? Before he said one thing about greater, he said you'll do what I did. Right? Okay. Okay. If they're talking about miracles, and that's what they always want to claim, just like others have done. That's what they want to pretend, just like others have done. And if that's what they want to do, say, hey, before he said a word about greater, he said the works that I do shall he do also. So it is a physical impossibility. It's against the law of physics that I can run farther than you run if I can't even run as far as you run. <coughs> right? Can you jump higher than I can without jumping as high as I can? Right. You can't jump higher than I jump and still not be able to jump as high as I jump. A Georgia mule knows that. <laughs> you can't run farther than I run till you run as far as I run. Right? <laughs> Forgive me for being a little facetious. But you can't have more children than I have until you have as many as I have. <laughs> How are you going to have 13 without having 12? <laughs> you see? It, it, it is ridiculous. Before you can do more, you've got to do as much, right? 
So if somebody comes along and he does indeed continue to make these claims, try to show him the truth of what the Scripture actually does say. And if he is contentious about it and insists that it still means that and I can do greater kinds of work than Jesus did, then I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to get him six jugs of water. Take it to him and say, okay, brother, turn it into wine. Now, if he can do more than Jesus did, he can do that one. That was the first thing Jesus ever did. He's just warming up then. <laughs> he, he just, he's just practicing on that one. So if he's going to do more, boy, he sure can do that one. He can do that in gym time. And if he does it, if he really turns that water into wine, don't get excited. Don't send for me. Don't write to the evangel. <laughs> Tell him what I want you to do. I want you to take him a couple of loaves of bread and some cans of sardines or salad. Say, okay, brother, start feeding them. <laughs> and when he feeds them, you count. And when he has fed 5,000 men plus the women and the children, and you pick up 12 baskets full, of scraps. Don't get excited. <laughs> Jesus did it too. Jesus did it twice. So don't get excited. And don't send for me. I don't have the airfare to get out of here. And don't write to the evangel. Tell you what I want you to do. I want you to wait until a real good old howling storm comes blowing through. Say, so, okay, brother, get out and stop it. Jesus did it. Did it without a blink of an eye. So if they can do more than he did, they can stop that storm. Now then, if he does it, write me a card. <laughs> Don't send for me, just write me a card. But there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to take him to one of your good old clear crisp west coast lakes and be sure it is a wide one and a deep. <laughs> and I want you to get him in a boat and say, brother, come with me. And I want you to roll him out to the middle of the lake and say, okay, brother, get out and walk. <laughs> and when he gets out, you head for the shore. <laughs> and don't you stop to pick up any hitchhikers on your way in. <laughs> if he makes it, send for me. And if he doesn't make it, don't worry too much about it. Because he will have died in a good cause. <laughs> he will have rid the world of one spot of error. It's just not like some people who leap from one pinnacle of sensationalism to another try to pretend that it is. Mm. The Word of God <coughs> appeals to us to have balance. Walk the tight rope of faith and don't let <laughs> the unbelief of some crowd you into one corner or the extravagant false claims of others crowd you into embarrassment. You stand up for the truth. Now then, as has been pointed out, I'll get to more of that tomorrow morning. The fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the ministry gifts are frequently intermixed all together because they work together not only in tandem but in union with one another. The multiple gifts of the Spirit frequently work in cooperation with each other. 
They must frequently work together. We're going to see that right now. And then tomorrow morning we're going to get into it very thoroughly and deeply. For instance, tongues is of little consequence, generally, unless it works in cooperation with interpretation. The word of wisdom is generally working along with a word of knowledge. A word of knowledge is frequently, as you'll see tomorrow, of any real benefit with us unless it is accompanied by a word of wisdom. Just knowing a fact is not good enough. You have to know what to do about that fact. So they work together, hand in hand. The discerning of spirits must work along with the gifts of healing and the working of miracles. Because it is the discerning of spirits that lets you know whether a gift of healing or a working of a miracle is really what is needed. And we'll see that very clearly. All of these work together. That's why Paul likens it to the human body. What good is an eye by itself? Or a hand or a foot? We all work together. That's another reason why the gifts are available to all of us all the time. Because we don't always know precisely which one is needed. Now then, even though they are tabulated, cataloged, and categorized in places in the scripture, they are never specified. It is never said that Sister Dorcas was exercised and manifested a word of wisdom, or that somebody else does. It just tells you the fact that it's left up to you to understand that the full body of the gifts are working at all times in order for them to do the things that they were doing. Now then, before I close tonight and tomorrow morning, we'll be getting immediately into the uh, totality of them. Let me close by showing you one thing that the Lord wants us to understand. In the 15th chapter of John, just before he was to go away. He said, I am the true vine and my father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. I've read this before, but I'll read it again. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. Listen, listen, listen. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except to abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. You can't even bear the fruit without Christ in you causing it to abound. You certainly can't manifest the gifts without that house. He is always the vine. You are always the branch. The branch is never superior to the vine. And we get into trouble when the branch tries to take the place of the vine. Now Jesus in this scripture is quite willing to share with us his dependency upon us. The vine doesn't bear the fruit. It doesn't do the work. The branch bears the fruit. But the branch bears the fruit as the vine gives it the power and the ability to do so. He is dependent upon us to be the extensions and the extremities to do the work. We are dependent upon Him for the power and the efficacy, the ability to do it. Now then, this is another place 
that I find sometimes need of understanding. The vine is always the only source from which the branch can get its power. And when people begin to try to outdo the vine, then they're going to run into problems. And I find people in this day trying to do that. I find people this day trying to be holier than the Lord called them to be. And a lot of the talk I hear about holiness is exactly that. Placing upon ourselves prohibitions and proscriptions. Mandates. Expectations that the Lord never laid upon us. You understand? Now then, it is as wrong to add to the Word of God as it is to take from the Word of God. Now we get all excited when someone begins to take away from the Word of God. Well, what about some of us who keep adding to the Word of God? He wants me to be holy. And He tells me how to be holy. And I will do what He said. But any other notions I begin to add onto it to try to be holier than He expects me to be, I've gone outside the Word of God and my life is going to run into wreck somewhere along the line. Do you understand that? Now then, I cannot bear fruit that He does not give me to bear or require me to bear. Neither can I do the works that are greater than He gives me to do or that He will do through me. All I can do is to be His vessel. And He will make me holy. And He will make me effective. And tomorrow morning when we get into these individuals, I need a whole session for that. Maybe a little more. But I need at least one whole session just on the individuals of them. Let me tell you, there's a wicked, needy, hurting, suffering world out there. And they need us to go out there with the goods. They need us to show them truth. They need us to show them reality. They need us to show them that and not to show them notions and ideas and theories. Therefore, you be sure that you have what God intends you to have. I'll be very, very honest with you now, as you'll see tomorrow. I would hate to live in this day without the infusion of the gifts and the fruit in my life. Every one of you that I'm speaking to are provided with a canopy that protects you and keeps you and empowers you against a growing evil day. And some of these things that he has promised us are in direct answer to the critical day that we're living in right now. And I for one with whatever courage I have, naturally, admit to you I would not want to go out into this world without being completely overshadowed, encapsulated with the power and the glory and the essence that God gives me by His Spirit.
Amen and hallelujah. Can you say amen to that? Let us stand and raise our hands for a moment of praise to him for what he has given us. And let us really thank him for being to us all that we need. Hallelujah.